Welcome to a new video about our book Make Capitalism History that we wrote in 2018 and then that's now translated to English. Um, in this video I want to um, focus on the aspect that comes up a lot, who collects the garbage in a society where there's no compulsion to work. And it will be about how communism became idealistic by focusing on the moral worker instead of material reorganization, about um, the critical psychology's concept of productive needs, about possible answers to the questions such as reorganization, automation, division, and maybe social norms, about the realm of freedom beyond necessity being a patriarchal and atomized vision of society, and about the danger of rewards if it's introduced for some work where it's really difficult to find people. Why against wage labor? That's um, also linked to our critique videos on command economy or planned economy um, and on market reformism. I, on the basis of this is the idea that things should be um, distributed according to needs and not according to power or money or performance or this kind of stuff. People who need the stuff should get the stuff. Um, that even performance that's kind of a lot of times is thought of a very just um, mode of distribution but who has who um, has the possibility to perform a lot it's also based on psychological and physiological possibilities and family structures and all, a lot of time even this is not really a just mean and it's still this main idea of compulsion is then around there that you have to um, produce stuff um, for um, so that you're allowed to get um, to live your living. Uh, if you um, pay people to work, um, this wage labor creates logic of exclusion. Um, it, it is it for the company that um, then pays the people to do this kind of stuff that they um, need to get done. This exploitation is suggested that they kind of they heighten the pressure and all this kind of stuff that you all know about. Um, there's the alienation of work that you don't um, really do the things that you really want to but that you're paid for that you go for the um, the exchange value of the work not for the use value like even for yourself you can even if you like work and there's still the productive needs are there we a lot of people like their work what they're doing but there's always these kind of stuff where you're like that doesn't make sense or why we need a boss or whatever all these kind of stuff that are linked to that it's based on as wage labor um, if we have <coughs> this use value in the center that's also very important for um, the for care labor because within a society that's based on wage labor there will always be this sphere this private sphere that's like attributed then a lot of times to women within patriarchy um, and this is separated and discriminated that's like that's that's naturally that it's done that people look after the children they want to do it that they cook the food and all this kind of stuff but it's a, a huge quantity of work that's done in the society within in germany it's like I think 53% like more than half of all the work that's done is unpaid care labor and that's like not considered work at all because it's just not paid for and we need a very big shift there that like care is in the center of our economy and not just like something that's um, around it's like very important um, to fight patriarchy and for feminism and this and a similar problem you had with in the command economy there still you have like a patriarchal structure the discrimination of care labor that still was all intact within the socialist um, economies then basically you have the violence of wage labor what it does to us that we discipline ourselves 40 hours or 50 hours or 60 hours for some only 30 or 20 hours um, a week that we force each other to do stuff that we don't want to and this force this discipline that we um, that we do to ourselves we can't just get rid of it when we get out into the sphere of freedom and consumption of this kind of stuff but we take it with us this alienation stays with us and it hinders our a relationship with people and the whole world around us that's based on our needs because we're so used to discipline ourselves within this violent wage labor relationship Within the market economy, you have the idea of each according to their work, wealth and power. Power is pretty important there. And you have this concept of unfair exchange that like people um, get 
very different um, salary for what they do in one hour. One, some people get ten thousands of dollars, one some people get one dollar. And if people from the global north go, go to the global south and then enjoy cheap carpets or cheap hotels or whatever, the thing that they really enjoy there is that the time of the people there is just less worth than their time. That they as humans are less worthy than the tourists that are around there. And this is like basic thing in um, capitalism, it's just we're used to it. Um, in the Marxist term would be the lower stage of um, communism or socialism. There is still this distribu distribution each according to their work and it's kind of a fair exchange. Every work will re would receive the same amount um, like one hour is one hour. It doesn't depend if the professor is working or um, if somebody is cleaning or whatever. Within the traditional Marxist framework there would be communism where there's each according to their needs um, and this generalized reciprocity where everybody um, gets what they need. There's not like this exchange I only give to you when you give back but this um, concept of a society of care where we look for each other, where we care for everybody. So now about the concept of human and I'll start here with um, the traditional Marxist idea of humans because there's still very bourgeois and a very, very like capitalist idea of how humans work. Um, I start with Lenin because I really like the story about the Subotniks. Um, it's within the socialist revolution in Russia, so we 1918, 1917, um, and there these Subotniks come around and there these starving workers are organizing communist Subotniks, working overtime without any payment. Is this not the beginning of a turn that is of world historical significance, of almost gigantic significance, the seeds of the new, the de facto beginning of communism? So that's very important for Lenin. He really loves these workers that are like working without wages. It is the beginning of an upheaval more difficult, more essential, more radical, more decisive than the overthrow of the bourgeoisie because it's a victory over one's own inertia, over one's own indiscipline, over petty bourgeois egoism, over this habit which cursed capitalism has left as a legacy to the workers and peasant. So that's like <laughs> Lenin's really big words about his communist subordinates. <laughs> and the concept that's behind there is really idealistic. It's an idealistic form of communism. Although these Marxists always claim to be a materialist, when it comes to compulsion to work and about a, a communist society, they become very moral and very idealistical. So this doing stuff is an individual task. It's a new social bond requires the continuous and persistent difficult heroism of everyday mass labor. So the people they just I have worked, whatever, 50 hours and now on Saturday I do my communist subordinate because I'm a communist. Um, and this is very strange because these people are forced all the time to do stuff and then, then they should do more of it because they're just good people and morally right and all this kind of stuff. So from in our perspective this problem is really individualized. Um, there's another quote here, the material incentive has always produced more in the way of initiatives because man is what he is, naturalization. Even in people's own factories and socialist brigades he thinks first of himself and his family. <clears throat> That's really interesting because while coercion is the normality with wage labor within the command economy, the socialist command economy, the refusal of coercion was made the problem. That like, first you force the people to do all this good stuff and then you're surprised, oh, they don't want to work more, they're bad uh, communists, they don't just want to work free for myself, for the state. And th these people are really surprised about it, but it's, it's kind of really makes sense. <laughs> it's not something morally wrong and if it's morally wrong, then it's something really wrong with communism. <laughs> um, and here communism becomes an educational task. It's morals instead of organization, of material reorganization. It's like people idealistically have to become communists and then we can create a communist society. But we have to organize our work in a very different way and that means 
centrally to get rid of the compulsion to work and then we will have a different society that we could call communism or post wage society or care economy or whatever we would call it but it's like central to change the material organization and not all oh, these people are so bad they don't want to work for free when they worked all the time before like eight hours or, or ten hours or whatever so <clears throat> This violence of compulsion is really at the center of capitalism. Um, with a lot of societies before capitalism, you will have a subsistence base um, for reproduction. And there people, a lot of times, they work because it makes sense to them. It's use value oriented. It's not for wage, not for exchange value. Um, the capitalist common sense can't imagine a world without compulsory labor. Of course, it's just for them a nice dream, but impossible, <coughs> because the compulsion justifies its own effects. It's a society based on compulsion, and then, yeah, just imagine the people don't, well, won't go to the factory, or they won't work 40 hours in garbage collection, or whatever. Of course they won't, because all the organization that we see around there is an organization based on compulsion. And people don't want to be forced to do stuff. But if we think of how society would be organized, materially organized, that's based on productive needs of people doing what is important to them, then we could imagine that people really want to do these things, or not only want, but it's important enough for them to do. It's always in between lust and necessity, between things that we have to do and that we agree on we should do it, even if it's not that funny, and things that we really want to do because they just make fun. It's kind of a circular argument there. The material reality of the society confirms its own ideology. It's called, it would, we could call it naturalization. The homo economicus as a capitalist subject is not only like very self-centered, but it's also consumption-driven and workforce. And that just makes sense that we are consumption-driven and workforce is just an effect of the society. It makes sense for us to do like to be like this because we're forced to do stuff. Of course we try to get rid of it and don't work that much. Yeah. Of course, there are all these ideologies that like masculinity masculinity is based on performance and then People work a lot more than they should work and get burnout or whatever, but that's also kind of an effect of this society. Okay, the basic psychological effect that's, um, that's linked to this is the crowding out of motivation. And there's this <laughs> funny story of Daisy and Ryan, two psychologists that make um, this experiment with children, gave to people the children paper and um, pencils, and it just just started to draw stuff and it's based on their productive needs they just did whatever they wanted to do the painted dragons and whatever and then they started to with the crowding out they say okay each paper you give us with a painting on it you get a gummy bear a gummy bear so <laughs> that's what they did and then they realized there are two different groups of children one one group that um, is like still painting very slowly and enjoy and color each um, cloud in a different um, color or whatever and then there's this other part of children and they even start with industrial production of paintings like they do like one stroke here one stroke here and that's a cloud and a gummy bear and one and, and all this kind of stuff they produce very quickly the interesting thing is when they stop to give the gummy bears to the children both groups stopped and what they said is like the the initial motivation of the children to do stuff was crowded out by reward. The reward economy got rid of the motivation economy, if you want to say it like that. Um, and there are a lot of meta studies on this term and crowding out happens if the task is interesting, materially rewarded and the rewards are expected. Then crowding out happens and that's basically we have a huge social experiment of crowding out in our society where we crowd out all, or not all, but a lot of the material interest. With the neoliberal economy, neoliberal capitalism, things changed and they realized we need a lot of creativity and we can't control workers that much. So there's a lot of these productive needs come back in, but basically it's still a crowding out society that we live in. Societal provisioning. Provisioning. If we think about animals, and we humans are animals basically, or we come from there, the animal provision that, like, for example, the squirrels have these um, hiding places for their nuts, has a biological drive. There's a drive behind it why they do it, it's an instinct, which is evolutionary adapted. 
if the <laughs> if it's too high then the squirrel will get all the time it's looking for nuts and it's a lot of waste of energy if it's too low then it doesn't get enough nuts and it will starve within the winter so this evolutionary drive evolutionary instinct to, to provision is kind of adapted humans are societal beings that means we organize each other with people that we don't know. That's like not only within a group, but we cooperate with people that we even don't know. And that's very early on within the human history, you will find this tendency that people cooperate, that people that you will find with sun hunter gatherer societies, you will find stones or whatever, some shells from like geographically from a very distant place. Um, and you also find like some techniques, social techniques or material techniques how to produce stuff on very different groups. So it's, that's like the human potential to organize themselves, to produce and reproduce themselves with people they don't know. And humans are champions of provisioning, <laughs> you could call it. <laughs> if you look around yourself, I don't know where you are then, but all the things, all the means around us, the language to speak, all this is humanly made and kind of built our own human world within the natural world and that's kind of a problem because our human world now destroys our natural world and then um, that's a huge problem now but it's a huge possibility of us humans that we create our own living conditions that we are not just um, out in nature and just have to have to do whatever nature tells us to do but we create our own um, human conditions, our own life living conditions. On the one hand, there's still this drive to produce the things that we need, like this provisioning things. On the other hand, we are societal beings. And this is what critical psychology links together in this concept of productive needs, that we have a need to reproduce ourselves within this um, society. Productive needs is the idea of Ute, Holzkamp, Oskamp, and the, the critical psychology sees this agency as the first human need as a possibility to satisfy the essential vital needs, such as food, shelter, sex, whatever. Um, and what humans want is to dispose of the sources of their satisfaction, and these sources are societally. So we can we don't produce all the things by our own, but we are dependent on others. Um, if you think about agency, then you can think of an unemployed pen, uh, person in the global north. They will be supported, at least <laughs> in countries with a welfare state, but they are only fed, but they have no agency. They don't really dispose of the sources of their satisfaction. So they just have a small agency by the money they receive each month. Agency by the critical psychology is understood as the ability to gain disposal over my respective individually relevant living conditions in association with others. There's this human need for agency and this need is basically the productive need. That we want to um, become an agent is our productive need. It's not so much a need for production but a need for provisioning. Work as such is not the first need of life, that's like a term, like an idea in Marx, but work only in so far as it, is it allows the individual to participate in the disposal of the social process, thus giving him or her agency. So there is this um, critical psychology says we have this productive need, people want to contribute to the society, want to like um, reproduce the societal structure so their, re the, so their life is kind of secure, their, the satisfaction of their essential vital needs. And of course critics come around and say, ah yeah, that's perfect for you, this concept fits your agenda of humans as hardworking bees, but that's, um, then people say, okay, yeah, we're not only consumption driven lazy bones, but is the inner motivation enough? There is this inner motivation, but it's really enough to do stuff. And motivation is within critical psychology just the evaluation of risk, effort, and positive effects. And this, within, a com within communism, we would do this on a societal level. We would think what things, strawberries, <laughs> bread, <laughs> medicals, or like space shuttles to fly to the moon, are these positive effects big enough for the risk and effort. So there will be like a societal motivation where we discuss things, are they important for us? 
And still, if we think of a society based on voluntariness, it's not everything is just great and beautiful and nice because we still have to do things of necessity, necessity not only based on lust and what we um, want to do, but also what we think is important. Um, so Ursula Le Guin, this um, writer, wrote in her marvelous book, The Dispossessed, somebody has to go to work somewhere where she doesn't really want to go because she leaves her husband, but um, she still goes. <clears throat> and when his husband, her husband thinks about it, he writes, you couldn't blame anyone. That was the, f that was the worst thing. Takaware was needed to fight hunger. His, her, Sadik's, their child's hunger. Society had nothing against her. And the neighbor says, it's just terrible. Not even a decade did they give her. Just come here now. And they say we are free people. We and free people, it's a joke. Tearing apart a happy marriage just like that. And I like this part because it shows that voluntariness in a, in a free society is not always that's like everything is beautiful and harmonious, but it's still, there's still work and still things we have to do, but we will work with it collectively. How can we organize it? And we don't just, within the capitalist system, it's easy. You just pay the people with the less privilege, whatever is needed, and then they do the task. That's, that's how you organize things that nobody else wants to do. We have different possibilities. We can reorganize it, we can automate it, we can divide and rotate it. Maybe social norms, may, uh, possibilities, and sufficiency is also important. So, reorganization. There's really interesting to look into non capitalist economies, um, and their work is never only a mean, it's only also a goal in itself. For example, for Atanians, they're like Hungarian peasants. Their work is only beautiful if many help. And Artanians also can say, when they work for the master, they will clear a field in a way that's like, it's done. But if they have the possibility, they can clear a field in a way that's really beautifully done. And that's important to them. Like their work is not only all about getting things done, but do it in a nice, beautiful way that they enjoy it. Also for Aku and gardeners, gardens are a world of work and life. It's usually um, that in this society, <coughs> women um, do the gardens. And it's not only a place where they go to work, but it's where they live, where they give birth, where they mourn, where they um, meet friends and all this kind of stuff. So it's a very different concept of work and place to work. It's also a very different rhythm to work in a lot of these non-capitalist societies where it's a lot more need-based. When I worked with subsistence farmer in Colombia, I was always kind of surprised that for three, four hours we would work like really, really hard, and then a friend would come around or we, and we would hang around for two hours and don't do that much, and then again we would like work really hard, and it's kind of something that's very need-based, and we look what is important to us and how we want to work. The Chuans also talk about when they're doing the tasks that are important to them in their subsistence economy. They would call it takat. And when they work for companies, for wage, they would call it with the Spanish um, term trabajo. So these people are subjects of reproduction and not objects of exploitation. And this means that we can have a glimpse how work and tasks could be organized in a very, very different way. And therefore, it's a, it makes a lot more sense and it, it's a lot more need-based and people want to do the stuff because it's much more fun and not that stressful and all these kind of stuff that are like the, the effects of an exploitive economy we wouldn't have in this kind of work. So in free organization we could already get a lot of um, rid of a lot of bad work. Um, and in communism resources flow into the improving the most disliked work, of course. It's like, oh, we really need washing machines, but nobody wants to be in this factory. How can we reorganize it in a way that people want it or think it's okay to work there at least two days a week or something. Automation, capitalism automates for money, communism automates for need. And within the ecological limits, there's like a big discussion how much, um, <laughs> how, like how much automation can still be borrowed of a, on a, on a, in the ecological society. And um, there it's also important what McLuhan once said that we shape our tools and afterwards our tools shape us. 
So um, this whole automation, this means of production, they kind of they, they build the environment in which we work in, and it's very important how we create this environment. Yeah. There also care work would be of increased um, importance within the capitalist economy, like care work isn't that important, of course, but it's because it's just privatized and not paid for. But in this society, of course, we could think, how can we automate these things? How can we communalize things if we want to do it? Minimize the burden, because burden of child upbringing, I think people who know have children, <laughs> I also have one, <laughs> that's like a lot of work. So there's also the positive ability of division and rotation. We have then a need efficiency and not a profit efficiency. Sometimes it may not be that efficient if not a, one person does it five days a week, but like three person do it at some one and a half days a week. But it's still, if nobody wants to do this task, it's still better for the society as a whole that people enjoy the task or it's a, at least it's okay to do it. In the social ecological movement, a lot of times, because there it's common based, all based, and voluntariness and collective disposal, you just get food of a um, collective kitchen if you're there, and that's it. And not if you have like if you work enough or kind of stuff. So a lot of time you will have this division and rotation just naturally popping up with the compost toilets or other tasks that people don't want to do them. There's still this question of like, freedom versus equality. Um, in our book, we focus a lot of on freedom and there are a lot of feminist scholars that then ask, okay, what about equality? That if just some people are much more um, willing to do the stuff that's important and some people are not. And usually it's <laughs> socialization, so <laughs> men may be like, ah, yeah, it's not so important, I'll do the stuff that I want to. And, and, <laughs> and women, of course, because of their socialization, are like, okay, that's very important, we have to do this kind of stuff and I'll do it. And then there's a new new hierarchies that will arise from there. So we'll have to be very conscious of these and how to um, deal with them and their rotation may also be a possibility. Okay, so social norms. And a lot of people when they think about a society, okay, why, why don't we have a social norm that people work, I don't know, three hours a day or four hours a day or whatever. Um, this this kind of the question, how do you make sure that people really work these three or four hours? Do they then only receive um, food or only then receive some scarce products or can go to the theater or do the um, bath or um, like the bathing institutions or whatever, to the sauna? <laughs> um, so it's very difficult with these social norms. Um, here I have a like it's just an example, you have a daycare conflict. In this daycare conflict, um, in this community didn't find enough people for the daycare facilities. And then some of the daycare facilities, they decided, okay, if you bring your child to us, you have to work 10 days in a year for us. And here's now the discussion in this, um, it's like fictional. For one side, it was clear the coupling of work and use severely restricts the basis of motivation. It is a return to the cult of community, command and blackmail. For the other side, to which I belong, one's own motivation hinged on justice. Why should I do tedious, unpopular work if the others don't care and rest on my labor? So that's like discussions you would have and you would have, of course, experienced some communes that said, okay, let's do this for daycare or whatever, where we don't find, let's just say, that's a social norm, people have to work a few days there or whatever. But it's kind of taking back civilizational standards. If our standards are, um, things are distributed according to need and not to work performance, then it's like of taking back civilizational standards, but still, they may be experiments like this, but if you go on with this, and of course you will be back in a wage society where people have to work to earn their income. Okay, the, the fifth possibility will be sufficiency. <laughs> um, for, if you think about ecology, we need an efficiency, but also a sufficiency revolution. Intelligent rationalization of means and a wise limitation of goals. Wolfgang Sachs called this once. And this is also against the idea of abstract growth. Of course, growth um, is needed at some places, but not growth in itself always growing more and more. <clears throat> and here Adorno writes, perhaps the true society will grow tired of development 
and out of freedom out of freedom leave possibilities unused instead of storming under a confused compulsion to the conquest of strange stars for me it's important to think what do we need and this society can decide because companies don't have to um, <laughs> sell their stuff all the time to gain profit, to compete with others and all that. So, so we really can decide what we want to do. And this is all, again, this societal motivation where risk, effort and effect are linked to each other. And one of my roommates, she works in, um, in gardening and then she said like straw, strawberry picking is so much work. She can't imagine that people would do this really. And it's not easy to do this with machines. So um, maybe there will be a lot less strawberries because people just say it's too much work. I don't want to do it. And this may happen in the society because the motivation that we, is around there, strawberries are like, it's nice to have, but not something very important, but the work is very hard and then it will be less there. In capitalism, it's just, yeah, you pay people and then they have to do it, whatever. So it would change a lot how we think about things and how we decide what to do and what to produce. Democracy means choosing the goals. And within capitalism, we can't choose the goal. The main goal of every um, productive activity is to make profit. Even if they don't want to, that's like the main up, um, goal they have. Not because they're bad people, but just because of competition, market. In capitalism, we rule via money and are used to live at the expense of others. Within a post society, we can't do this. We have to agree with each other what's important to do. Okay, so now finally some frequently asked question. There's often this question, what is enough and will be the work enough? Um, companies have to build demand so they can sell their products. So of course, maybe there still will be something where like at Wirtschaft demand and communism, I can't imagine, but it will be very different and not linking like Coca-Cola to a happy marriage or whatever, like this picture does. In capitalism, needs are very fixed on consumption that like, because like the whole sphere of work, of like having a fulfilling work, do things that are important to us, is organized according to alienation and exploitation. So it kind of tells us um, that this different sphere of consumption exists. And then it was the same for market societies as command or like the real socialism in 20th century, that it was like consumption oriented. And that's like what, what was the reward for the hard work that the people did. Um, and it also creates consumption hierarchies because these hierarchies maintain the social stability that oh, yeah, I, I can work more, I can do a career and then I'll get in whatever, a nice house somewhere or a um, new computer or whatever it is. Um, Hartmut Rosa that worked in this and uh, like his work says that his desire for resonance is turned into a, de a desire for objects. So if you want to um, experience music, what capitalism does to this desire to experience music is it says, okay, you just get a really good sound system, then, then you will really have a good musical experience. Or if you want to um, have something different in life, you do a really exotic trip somewhere to the global south and there you'll get it. So it's always like object fixed. And this alienation is very much in the consumption area as well. Or there is some freedom there, of course, but this alienation really destroys our relationship to the world and the things that we buy each day. There's this contradiction of work discipline against hedonism. Like there's this work discipline very hard and on the other hand, this very strengthening idea of hedonism in consumption. This kind of doesn't work because the work discipline we experience every day, also within school, within university, whatever, and, um, in the place where we get educated, will take it into the consumption, the sphere of consumption. In this society, in a post-wage society, in communism, the link between productive and essential um, vital needs is built. That we really think, what is enough? Is it important to have big houses? Is it important to have swimming pools? If it's important enough for us and the and the work, then we will have it, we'll produce it, because it's important enough. But if it's not, we won't. Um, there's often this idea of the realm of freedom versus the realm of necessity. <clears throat> and this often takes this turn of play versus work. And Marx said, uh, this famous quote of him, by the realm of freedom indeed only begins where work determined by necessity and external expediency ceases. 
And that's a very capitalist and patriarchal idea of freedom. Because this appropriation of female care work um, that's excluded from production is very clear there. Because we will never automate all the care work that's just there. And we, th this will stay a realm <laughs> of necessity that we can get rid of. And also Marx says in a quote, it's not about getting rid of all the realm of necessity, but to organize the realm of necessity in a way that freedom is at its center. That our needs are at the center of, of fulfilling the necessities that we need. Our utopia is a social, not a technological utopia. With, like, with a lot of people who want to get rid of the compulsion to work, they will have like, this really fully automated luxury communism where like, everything is taken care of. That's not what we think. That's, I think that's not possible within the ecological limits. Um, and with taking into care labor and all this kind of stuff. So it's about organizing these things in a different way, not just getting rid of them. We should get rid of some of them. The picture next to the end, we see this iceberg, and that's like the part that we see is like the productive labor that's paid for, and all the other parts, all the care labor and the labor. Um, some feminists, also feminist economists, scholars talk about the nature as labor that all gets into it, and we this realm of um, necessity idea only gets rid of the top part, and even this is like questionable. Yeah. Of course, there's then always this question, some reward place, why do we have to get rid of all the rewards? Shouldn't we have like a high UBI for most of the stuff, people just get what they need? And then there's a material reward for some disliked work. For example, let's take daycare. There's a reward for daycare because we don't find enough people to do this kind of stuff. Um, then this reproduction moves to exchange value orientation that the people are there they do it because they get something for it and this like changes the whole production there um exploitation gets important like people want ah yeah you can get it done quickly then you don't have to, then you won't receive that much for it and so it's like socially it's the social logic then behind it and there may be a sphere of exchange so if these people that were in the daycare i don't know what they receive some like some scarce products like television or computers then they can start to um, trade them and I'll give you my television that I get and, and you can um, tend to my house or <laughs> tend to my children or clean it or whatever and of course this sphere may get bigger because people say that's not just like we're doing we're producing these washing machines it's also very tough labor and we want to get rewarded for this and we want also to be part of this reward economy then it grows this society is not a perfect society where everything is fine so we may create this reward space but the question is can we like limit them and i'm very skeptical <laughs> about this if you have good ideas for it maybe put it forward <laughs> And in this society, people may start with this reward economy again. But on the other hand, you have all these experiences. What happens then? Like you have this, like a capitalist history that you can think of. What happens to the people that work there? And so there will be a much discussion if you want to start this reward economy, what kind of inequalities, what hierarchies it creates again within this society. So I hope that it was interesting for you and thanks for listening.